Hey, if I can have your attention. Good. My name is Jack Duvall, and at present I'm the senior counselor and founding director of ICNC. Peter Ackerman and I decided to establish this organization uh, in 2001. We formally established it in January of 2002 when we had created a demand for knowledge about civil resistance through writing a book and creating a television series called A Force More Powerful. How many here have seen parts of A Force More Powerful and or the book? Uh, I'm sure because you have come to the Summer Institute, uh, you'll be able to get a copy of either of those yourself for free. If you don't, feel free to email me if, you have a, don't, if you'd like a copy. That's the history of nonviolent conflict in the 20th century. Uh, it's about, the book covers about 24 major movements and there are six major movements covered in a three-hour PBS television series which has since been translated into about a dozen languages or more. The book has only been translated into one other language, amazingly, because it's a huge book, which was Thai, because there's a great scholar of civil resistance in Thailand and he decided he had to have this book translated into, so he could teach with it at the university in, uh, in Thailand. But um, the presentation and talk I'm giving today has to do with the content of a book that I'm writing which grows out of my experience largely with ICNC and as a writer and a, an unofficial scholar in this field. I say unofficial because I'm a not, not an academic. There is freedom in not being an academic if you want to write because you don't have to worry about academic theories that you can, you're supposed to defend yourself against. But uh, no, you still have to do that. But, um, because there is theoretical warfare in every single academic discipline, in case you didn't know. This particular presentation um, originally had to do with what movements are supposed to stay, say in order to be able to organize and mobilize people successfully. But my understanding of this subject has evolved and so this presentation has evolved and the form that it's going to take in this book represents a further revolution which is somewhat more theoretical. But the question, what is this, is the central question to ask if one is going to think about the meaning of nonviolent movements. And the meaning of a movement is not necessarily what it means to you, it's what it has to mean or what it should mean or what it can mean in order to be able to elicit participation, which as you know is really critical. So really what is this phenomenon? If you are um, a member of the media, you, one of the most common words you may have used to describe um, this phenomenon as it is physically and socially and politically manifested is unrest. Wow, what a precise word. But that's probably the most common word that you hear on television news about a protest. It's unrest. It's the opposite of rest. That doesn't tell you very much about civil resistance. If there's a political frame for thinking about this, it's a political opposition. It's an act of opposition. Well, yes, that, that much should be obvious. Protest, a very common word. Interestingly, probably the best, closest, descriptive word of what at least the outward form of resistance would take. And others use the word uprising, which is perfectly good as well, because usually, but at least that gets to the idea that the public, that the people themselves are rising, are forming some extraordinary activity in order to assert themselves uh, in the context of a revolution. I no longer really like the word revolution in, in this respect, partly because uh, it's been the nub of a gigantic campaign, primarily from Moscow, of disinformation about all nonviolent movements in the world, which they've tried to rename color revolutions, which is predicated on a false theory and represents mostly disinformation. <laughs> but the other reason not to use the idea of revolution, that does <coughs> connote the idea of some huge um, transformation, some complete change in the lives and fortunes 
of everyone involved in a particular country or wherever the movement is taking, and typically oversells the idea of the, the Arab Spring was a term that I liked a little bit better because it was non-specific and therefore it could be used to cover a variety of different kind of movements until for its own reasons the, me the media decided not to, um, <coughs> con that the, the Arab Spring was over, which it isn't of course. But of course what we call it at ICNC is civil resistance, which is an emerging force in the world for rights and justice and other causes that may, might, may not be covered by those two words. The language that is used in a movement that is infused with meaning about the nature of the struggle, the language of change, if you will, if you approach that language as a layman, relying only on the vocabulary of change that the news media uses, most of the words you'll encounter which, which identify actors in a struggle are going to be on the left-hand side of these two columns of words because they emerge from a structuralist understanding of political and social phenomena. And they therefore begin with states and governments and talk about rulers and what they can do, the need to pass laws to actually accomplish change, supposedly, the work of elites behind the scenes, the use of institutions in political processes, the conditions which may prevail, which either allegedly may prevent you from acting or enable you to act. And all of this is depicted in physical terms. And it's all unrest. But for each of these factors or individual actor, individual actors, individual forces in a conflict, even a nonviolent conflict, there's a corresponding idea that represents the reality of how civil resistance is conducted and how nonviolent movements proceed. Everyone who isn't any, are there any states present here in this room today? No, but everybody here is a non-state actor and that's the new term of art in international parlance about every, everyone is a, is a non-state actor, relatively non-specific. All citizens are non-state actors and citizens are, represent the people who have to provide their consent to a government or can withdraw consent from a state of affairs in order to demonstrate their unwillingness to be obedient to it. They're part of civil society and movements arise from civil society, learn skills to be able to take action effectively, accomplish political and social objectives through resistance. It's important, I think, to understand that all of us who want to have a, a holistic understanding and an understanding as practiced on a daily basis of how civil resistance works is to move from the vocabulary on the left-hand side of this chart to the vocabulary on the right-hand. And in so doing, you surrender the mesmerism of the state. And it leads to this, the dynamic of civil resistance, as I sum it up, is that when the people deprive an oppressor, someone denying them their rights, of their consent, that reduces the oppressor's legitimacy so that questioning can begin about the propriety of what that oppressor is doing. And when enough people refuse to cooperate, that increases the cost of the state holding control. And the challenge then is to the viability of the existing setup, the existing oppression. Whether or not it's legitimate, it may not be sustainable. You start with the reduction of legitimacy and because of the actions of resistance, which have an economic impact, the cost of holding control is raised to a high point. So when the system's legitimacy drops and the costs rise, doubts begin within the structure of oppression about whether it's even sustainable. You get double mind, useful double-mindedness among those who are. But what is, there is an inflection point, obviously, in the life of a movement which may mark the moment at which it's becoming obvious that something is being summoned from people in terms of organized action that may reach a 
force may summon a force, may bring forth a force that will have to be dealt with by the state, and a full conflict has occurred. And Desmond Tutu, one of the leaders of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, I think nailed it when he said in an interview with Steve York, the producer of the Force More television series, Force More Powerful television series, when people decide they want to be free, once they have made up their minds to that, that's the critical point. There is nothing that can stop them. Why would he put so much importance on people just making up their minds while they're riding the bus, while they're sitting at home, while they're having a snack, when they make up their minds to the idea that they want to be free, that they want their state of affairs, the state of affairs of their life and their lives together, <coughs> that's when nothing can stop them. So how do those who want to organize a movement appeal to minds? You can use what I call instrumental language, which is the usual menu that's on the list for people organizing movements, but it's limited. You identify material self-interests that are in jeopardy or that are threatened or being degraded by the action of an oppressor. You may just want to settle grievances or you want, may have an ide ideological agenda that you favor. That's the, the, all that is the typical basis or predicate for the construction of a movement and the language you use is instrumental because it's focused on accomplishing specific functional movement experiential achievements. There's nothing wrong with any of that and all that has to proceed but that's the underbody. That's what I would call the underbody of the movement. The overbody is something that is often neglected and yet in my judgment is even more important than the functional or instrumental things you do in order to have an effective movement. And that comes from the use, the use of ideational language which will familiarize oneself with the inventory of possibilities throughout the full gamut of human capabilities that can be summoned and called upon during the course of a movement. And that centrally focuses on the content, the content of what a movement stands for. And that in turn is based on the identity of those who are doing the movement because they are being suppressed in some way. Their very identity, ethnically, religiously, in terms of gender or in other respects, may be suppressed, or simply their rights, their normal civil rights or human rights may be suppressed. And so to free themselves from that oppression, they have a shared purpose. This is what Desmond Tutu meant. When people make up their minds to be free, then nothing can stop them. Here's one interesting example one of the most cleverest examples and one of the one of the best examples of that moment that arrives what people do it what those who are organizing some form of action do in order to successfully pass through that moment of conception and inception of a movement these are the mothers of the disappeared in a, in a later demonstration wasn't their first action how many people here are familiar with Las Madres de la, de la Plaza de Mayo Okay, so there are a lot of folks here who are familiar with this. One of the most important, ideationally, one of the most important movements ever organized and ultimately a successful movement because it started the unraveling of the power of the military junta that controlled Argentina in the so-called dirty, during the so-called dirty war uh, in the 1970s. Their first proposition to the country as to what they were doing when they appeared by surprise in the central square of Buenos Aires in 1977 wearing children's diapers on their heads as bandanas. They were mothers of usually young men and women who had been abducted and killed by the regime because they had been engaged in dissent or dissidents of some kind. Sometimes 
put on planes and helicopters and just dropped out into the sea. Favored method of execution by the gentle generals of the Argentine junta. And so they just ask a question. We are the mothers of the disappeared, the ones who have disappeared. And we have come to ask, where are our children? This is an ingenious way to begin to proceed against a regime. It doesn't characterize the regime as evil initially. It doesn't issue a demand. It asks a question that is based on a reasonable interest that everyone would agree is a reasonable interest. Their children have disappeared and oh yeah, the state has the responsibility to provide security. And this is a security conscious state. Surely they must know where our children are. They can find our children. So was this a pose? Of course this was a pose because they knew that the state had done this, but they didn't start with that accusation. They started with this proposition based on reason. And the diapers that they were wearing on their head endowed them with the significance, a couple of different forms of significance. What's the role of a mother? She's at the pivot of life's continuity. Her role in the society is unchallengeable based on an objective understanding of how a society can function. If she doesn't know where her children are, the society has a problem. Everybody has a problem if lots of mothers don't know where their children are. And that also reaches people's hearts. It affects their sense of what, how decent the society is. All the questions having to do with whether this society as allowed to be half governed or ungoverned by this military dictatorship were called to the fore by that simple question, which is, by the way, uh, I'll, I'll discuss that in a couple of minutes, what I call a unifying proposition in a movement. So the call to action is entirely for people to think about. The first bar of the, car to action, of the call to action, the line that you cross, is a line that you cross in your minds. This is therefore about the language of how to summon people to a movement is really about the content of what they come to believe, what they come to believe is important, what they come to believe are the stakes, what they come to believe about themselves, what they come to believe about their country. And the content of believing, not beliefs, not a belief in X, Y, or Z that someone has prescribed to you, but what you come into, what comes into the container of your continuous action of believing. You're always believing something. I believe the weather is going to be good today. I believe I'm a good person. I believe that the summer incident is a great thing. Or I believe in God. Or I don't believe in God. But the content of believing, unpacking that and investigating what you can put into that has to do with summoning people's minds to whether you're going to join a movement. And all of this is taking place in the context of our use of language. But I'm not talking about language instrumentally. I'm talking about the content that we're going to be using. And the first critical notion represented so well in the mother's question to the government of Argentina is reason. There has to be a chassis of reason. There has to be an argument based on reason that a movement is using. Because, first of all, that respects the minds of the people you're talking to. It says, I'm going to persuade you. I'm not going to try to force you into following me. That doesn't work anyway. It also gives you credibility because you're proposing a rational argument. And most importantly, it requires you to tell the truth. There's no such thing as a rational argument based on lies. The American president who did can I, what I'm going to do, excuse me, I'm going to wait for questions until the end. I'm going to get through the whole presentation so you have it holistically so we don't break it down that way. Just my preference. I know, but this happens all the time. Whenever the time comes, the last two minutes we have to rush for the... Rush. Don't worry, I'll, I'm, I'm a good clock watcher. Um, so most, of you pro uh, most of you probably know who Abraham Lincoln is. And um, uh, he was a president who was probably the most rational thinker among all the American presidents to date. And he was so passionate about the use of reason, he said that he called it 
cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason. That must furnish all our materials for the future. And he said this 20 years before the struggle he eventually led in the Civil War against slavery. The, the materials for our future support and defense comes, he said, from a rational argument. And then he said, let those materials, which is to say the content of our argument, of our rational argument, let all that be molded into a general intelligence, which he conceived of as an intelligence that collectively people would subscribe to. The second component or dimension of content in believing um, is uh, what, I'll, what I call cognitive formation or cognitive authoring, which is the growth within a movement on a plenary level of a cognitive awareness and a, co and a, and a different cognitive frame for how you think about and how you understand your circumstances. This gentleman is Adam Michnik, one of the most famous um, original theorists of and much imprisoned activist uh, in Poland uh, prior to the throwing off of the communist regime. And I'll let Maciej Barkowski pronounce this word which he used to describe what uh, I call cognitive authoring. Louder. Podmiotowość. Okay. Um, the uh, a one word one word is always better than several words, uh, but he described that as the capacity of individuals, and by this he understood individuals in what was then a proto movement or a pre movement. It wasn't even a fully organized movement at that point. The capacity of individuals or collective subjects to be the authors of their own lives. This is agency, which is a meaning of that word in Polish and we're capable of reflecting on our lives, on the meaning of what we're doing and of the meaning of what we are going through. And he saw this himself, as did many other Poles, in 1979 when the first Polish Pope came to visit Poland. And the communist state decided it couldn't have anything to do with the Pope or the Church, so they allowed the Church to organize the entire visit, which ended up becoming a trial run for how to organize uh, on, a national, on a nationwide basis. Um, and uh, one observer uh, characterized this, as the, not only this particular demonstration, the, uh, well in ways, in a way it was a demonstration even though it was an open air mass when the Pope came to Warsaw, but that crowd had an, the size of that crowd and the fact that it was entirely nonviolent the fact that it was well behaved and incredibly well individually self-disciplined was noticed by everything, by, by everyone. So all these people beheld themselves and were strengthened by feeling their own presence. This idea of presence was noticed by people. And when she was asked, um, a woman who became the, actually the trigger point for the Gdansk shipyard strikes which be, led to the formation of solidarity, she was asked, what all that organizing and what all those crowds to go, go out to see the Pope meant to the later emergence of solidarity as a movement in the society. She said, what did it, how did that happen? And she said, well, we became braver. You lose your fear. You lose your fear of the oppressor because you can see what you can do. And you understand what the real source of power is in a movement. It's not just in the physical numbers. It has to do with what's going on in mind. A third component of this is the certainty that you have that you will be successful, which at some point along the line presents itself in your own understanding and in your own conviction. Fannie Lou Hamer was a major actor in the civil rights movement in the American South in the 1960s. And she was especially known for the fact that she was completely indomitable. She could not be stopped. She was truly a force of nature. Before I unpack this quote for you, um, I'll tell you that the idea that I got for the need to expand the understanding of the use of language and what it represented and can bring to movements and fire people's minds 
came to me originally from Jim Lawson here at the Summer Institute six years ago when one night we drove back to the hotel together and we were uh, we started talking about something. We ended up sitting there in the car in front of the hotel and talked about this for an hour. We didn't want to get out of the car because we didn't want to lose our train of thought together about this subject. And we were talking about what had been missing from a presentation that someone gave during the day. And he was talking about the subjective content of what those who were involved in a movement bring to their understanding of what they're doing and how that manifests itself in the form of their action and, uh, and the outcome of the action that they take. And he suddenly used the example of Fannie Lou Hamer, and he compressed the story, one, one famous story of what happened to her on one day. He said, you know, she goes out and she organizes a successful voter registration drive in northern Mississippi. She's driving back to her, to her town where she lives late at night by herself in her car. She stopped on the side of the road by the police. They take her to the jail and they beat her almost to death in the jail. She's hospitalized for 30 days and on the 31st day when she's released from the hospital she goes out and starts another voter registration drive. And so Jim turns to me and looks at me and says why did she do that? Why would any sane person do that? For this reason she knew that if she quit the movement the movement would fail and that if she did not quit the movement and if she remained in the movement it would be successful. She had identified fully her own fate, her own prospects with those of the movement. Her identity to some extent had merged with the importance of that movement and so that spirit is behind this statement that she made in September 1964, we're on our way and we won't turn around. We don't have anything to fear. We can discern the new day. We can see where we are going. There's no uncertainty left in her at this point whatsoever. We are determined that one day we'll have the power of the ballot. This conviction and this spirit of certitude has another form of content wrapped around it that is extremely important which I call affective force. I think movements summon affective force and that has to do with how you feel about yourself, how you feel about the other who you are trying to change and also about the others with you in this effort. James Baldwin was a, a very well uh, known and uh, much beloved novelist in the 1950s and 1960s and he wasn't really in the civil rights movement but he wrote about it and spoke about it and in The Fire Next Time, anybody here read The Fire Next Time? It's a great book, it's very short and it's about the, str the struggle of the civil rights movement from this kind of perspective and um, he, the, before I read this quote and unpack it, Baldwin said we have, when he would talk with uh, fellow African Americans, he would say, our number one task is to love white people. And they would say, what are you talking about? We have to love white people he, because he said, they are ignorant about the real state of America. And the only thing you can do with someone who is ignorant is to love them. We know that there is injustice in this country. White people do not know that there is injustice in the country. Therefore, we know something they don't know. The only way we can teach them is to show them that we love them and we want them to be part of a completely transformed country. So he said, love is a battle. Love takes off the masks we cannot live without and no, we cannot live within. There's something that's untruthful about living behind a mask. He says, I use the word love here as a state of being or a state of grace in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth, willing to universalize the stakes and the values at the heart of this battle and willing to, to have that sense of daring that Fannie Lou Hamer had. 
That last line of what Baldwin said is exactly what Vaclav Havel had in mind when he um, wrote his tremendous track, The Power of the Powerless, which is a very, very long essay or a very, very short book, which is, I think, the single most important written piece of work about civil resistance in the 20th century. And he, in my judgment, is the most important thinker about how civil resistance works after Gandhi until that point in time. And Hobble says in The Power of the Powerless to give his explanation of how power is unleashed by a movement, he says the dissident shatters the world of appearances, takes off the mask. He demonstrates that living a lie is living a lie. And he shows everyone that it's possible to live within the truth. Living in the lie constitutes the system only if it's universal. This is why, as my colleague Peter Ackerman says, the authoritarian, to use an American baseball analogy, always has to bat a thousand. Because the next mistake they may make is the mistake that can start to unravel their power. And they know that. So they have to keep the edifice of lies intact. And if you take away one lie, you started the deconstruction of the entire edifice that is in people's minds about the power that this regime has. So Havel says, there are no terms whatsoever on which that system can coexist with living within the truth. And therefore, everyone who steps out of line denies it in principle and threatens it in its entirety. This is where the deconstruction begins of the illegitimate power that you're trying to challenge. And it worked. It worked almost immediately in Eastern Europe, beyond Czechoslovakia, Havel's country. Zbigniew Buzak, uh, an activist in solidarity in Poland when he was underground in the early 1980s, found the power of the powerless that Havel had written extremely useful. He says, this essay reached us in the tractor factory in 1979 at the end of the road. We were at the end of the road. We didn't know what to do. Reading it gave us the theoretical underpinnings for our activity. Okay, they were good students about what it actually meant. It maintained our spirits also, equally important as actually getting specific knowledge from it. We did not give up, Fannie Lou Hamer like. And a year later, it became clear that the party apparatus and the factory management were afraid of us. A turning of tables in the subjective balance of the history of what was going on beneath the surface, which would soon manifest itself above ground. So I think you know the answer to the question now, how to galvanize a movement. Can you do it with what I call transactional or material content, with like an opposition political platform and a list of policies and angry complaints about the status quo? I don't think so. That may be important for political people. But the majority of citizens in an oppressed country don't start from a state of political agitation or perhaps even much political awareness. It's the language of humanity itself which is the source of the content of believing that then begins to unleash the process that I've tried to describe. Alberto Manguel, an Argentine-Canadian uh, literary scholar, uh, wrote a wonderful book about language, the single most important book I've read in the course of doing the work that I'm doing right now on this new book called The City of Words. I absolutely recommend it. Uh, it's stellar. Says, makes this, says, puts this contrast in his own terms. He says, the language of politics purports, alleges, to address real categories, freezes identities into static definitions, segregates but fails to individualize. The language of poetry and stories, which is his version of the kind of subjective language we're talking about that movements need to develop, groups us under a common and fluid humanity while granting us at the same time self-revelatory identities. People involved in movements often come and say, I never really knew who I was until I went to that movement. I discovered who I was, what I was capable of, who I really am. 
what kind of an individual, what kind of a human being or a person I really am. I reveal myself through what I do in this movement. This is a, an achievement, therefore, I would argue, the successful organizing a movement at a very high level. So that's the language of truth. These are the five principal components or windows into looking at the content. Others may come up in the future with a better analysis of that content. It leads to, it led to intuitively by Mohandas Gandhi, uh, what I call his unifying proposition to the Indian people. He boiled down his challenge to the Indian people, much as the Mothers of the Disappeared did in Argentina in 1979, in an equally clever way, also with a kind of Socratic question. Amazing what Socratic questions can start in terms of unraveling the counter argument that might begin after you issue your challenge. And he said essentially, the British are ruling this country, said this in the 1930s, for their own benefit. They pretend they're ruling it for us, they're just benign rulers, but that's false, that's a lie. They're ruling it for their own benefit. So why should we help them? Why should we collaborate? Why should we cooperate? And then, of course, he explicitly described his campaigns as non-cooperation campaigns. We're going to withdraw every single way we facilitate this oppressive, invading, occupying power from controlling our country. And in so doing, in summoning the commitment of tens of millions of Indians to the cause of engaging in civil resistance in a variety of forms, he really he had to appeal to the values and the sense of honor that Indians had. He had to appeal to principles which they already held in common in the context of their own civilization. In other words, he appealed to heritage, the, the legacy of goodness we take from the past and which we still cherish today. This isn't partisan, but it's for posterity. We have to project into the future the best part of who we are, the goodness of our civilization, reconstitute it, and then predicate our outward observance and enforcement of our political and social rights on that. And the meaning of this is not only the liberation, but also the transformation of ourselves, first of all, so that then our society can be transformed. It produces what I call an existential movement in a way. This is about the affirmation of life, and the affirmation of life necessarily entails the refusal to accept death, because regimes who take your rights away from you are predicating their power on the ability to kill people, which represents death. This happens to be a comment that I found in a, a critical philosophical study of the music of Beethoven. By the way, there, there will be in the book I'm writing uh, a lot of references to music because of the similarities of the composition and orchestration of music and, the partic and participation in singing and in playing music which are cognate with the subjective action that goes on within movements. But this particular critic said of, uh, the, uh, of a particular movement in the A minor quartet of Beethoven. He said, we are presented here with a will to live, transpose this to a movement, which is inexpressibly furious. Yes, there is a fury that you can express through your action, and inexpressibly bare, simple, austere, direct, clearly identifiable and understandable to everyone who is a witness or a participant. It is the expression of the final refusal of annihilation. So in a larger sense, this is a life or death choice. Do you join this movement or do you not join this movement? If you join the movement, you're joining fundamentally an expression of life. Now there may not be a easily mobilizable way to get people to, to um, I know there, was, there used to be a chain of bookstores in Washington DC called Yes! exclamation mark. 
and it had a lot of books on nonviolent action inside. They were trying to get people interested in nonviolence. They wanted people to choose nonviolence because it represented affirmation. Usually, though, let's be practical about circumstances, in most countries that have serious and difficult problems, there is a need to alleviate those problems. And usually there is a government which isn't doing the right thing or is actually engaging in oppression and changing that government and having a frame shift politically or an even more profound societal frame shift forward is absolutely essential. So raising the stakes of what is really involved to represent something that is much more of an existential choice is not only legitimate, I would say it's even descriptive. Even, em even embryonically, in the simplest of a movement, it may be present. So the question becomes, how then do you develop it? So where's the movement? Where is the locus of a movement? Is the locus of a movement in a big, huge demonstration? Is the locus of the movement in Tahrir Square? It was never in Tahrir Square in Egypt, but most of them didn't know it. Most of them felt such a, there was a physical place re-identification that somehow they got the idea of a new collective energy and, and a collective cognitive formation that they were going through. There are numerous Egyptians who were present who experienced that and wrote about it profusely afterwards. So they definitely went through this subjective change. But strategically, they thought that the presence together in Tahrir, the physical presence in Tahrir, was where the movement was. It wasn't in a physical place at all. It's never in a physical place at all. It's always in your thought and in your hearts, which are joined together in consciousness. <laughs>